this morning. Amen. The rest of you need to get saved. Amen. And then you'll be happy. Amen. Amen. For our visitors that are here for the first time, I'm sorry Pastor Lawson is not preaching. I would be disappointed if I was here and he wasn't preaching. And, uh, but do pray for me if you will. Uh, the devil has definitely been fighting me on this message all week. Yesterday he tried to destroy my whole day so I couldn't concentrate on the Word of God. So I know I'm on the right path. Amen. And I want you to please turn with me if you will to Matthew chapter 7. And while you're turning there, stand to our feet in reverence to the Word of God as we always do. Uh, do pray for our pastor. I love my pastor. I appreciate my pastor. I don't worship him, but he is a true man of God, and that is a rarity in these days. And I praise the Lord for him. I'm thankful I get to preach. I still would rather hear him, but do pray for him. And Sister Linda, let's ask the Lord to please just refresh them, protect them, and give them the strength that they need to provide a hedge of protection around them. Because I want him to come back and get right back where he belongs. Amen. Amen? And, uh, but I do want the Lord to minister to them. I want the Lord to help them. Uh, but this morning, you're here by no accident. Amen. No matter if it was your plan or God's plan, you're here for a reason. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, uh, read to yourself as I read these verses, please. The Bible says, and Christ is speaking... Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful, what's that next word? Works. Works. Verse 23, the saddest verse with another verse in Revelation, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I praise you. You alone are holy. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Father, I invite you. We all invite you to be in our midst this morning, Father. Lord, you're the only one that matters on being here. Yes. Father, please, through your Holy Spirit, use your word to prick our hearts. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that's lost, Lord, I pray today would be the day that you open their hearts and their minds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, for those of us that are saved, Lord, remind us that you saved us from the pit of hell. Lord, remind us that we are to be actively seeking the lost to try to witness and try to bring people to Christ. Father, I pray that you be glorified this morning. Lord, we need you. Father, if we just come to say that we've been in church, we've wasted our time. Amen. Father, I've come because I want you to minister to me even as I preach, Father. Lord, I need you. I'm nothing without you. Father, there is nothing good in and of myself. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done in my life. Thank you for saving me. Father, I pray now that you would take your word and do that which only you can do, and that is penetrate our hearts. Help us, dear God, to obey whatever you tell us to do today. We ask this in Christ's name for his honor and glory. Amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for standing. As we think about what is taking place in our nation and in country and throughout the world, America has definitely been a shining light throughout its history of existence of getting the gospel to other lands, but that light is going out. That light is going out, and while, as we sang, revive us again, I'm afraid we're at the point in our own nation to where we need another awakening. Amen. It's good to be revived, and those of us that are saved, we need to be revived. I need to be revived, but revival will not happen if it doesn't start with me. I want my church to be revived. I want my nation to be revived, but that revolves around whether I'm going to submit to the Father or not as a saved child of God. But there are so many today, as we read in these verses, they have the right lingo. They know how to say the right words. They might even carry the right Bible. They may even go to the right church. But there are many on the pews this morning throughout this nation and probably here as well who still do not know Christ as their personal Savior. They call Him Lord, and He is Lord. In fact, He's the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. 
and they talk about the Lord, and they reverence the Lord with their words, but their heart is far from Him. And there are many that are darkening the pews of churches today throughout this land and throughout the world. They have gotten to the place that they are religious instead of saved. I remember in our years of serving the Lord in Spain that we dealt with many Roman Catholic people who uh, they were proud to claim that they were Catholic. And listen, if you're going to claim to be proud of something, be proud of what you are if you're convinced that it's the truth. But as we began talking to people, yes, they're Catholic, but you know how many of them denied that they believed in God? What's more important? Believing God or being a religious name? Even pastor, and I thank him so much for how he brings this out often. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist. That's not the way to heaven. Amen. It's knowing Christ as your personal Savior. And too many today are going through the religious game. They're going through the religious motions. And they too will hear the words that they hear in verse 23. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. And they're going to hear the sad words, depart from me. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And we sit by them week in and week out. Week out. We, we have them in our own family. They have that appearance of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They have the right things to say. They've learned what to say after someone says something that is truth. They'll say, Amen. But what difference does it make if you do not know the Savior? What difference does it make if you've been baptized, but you haven't? been born again. And there are many today, when you talk to them about their salvation, the first thing that comes to their mind, well, I've been baptized. I'm sorry, but if you haven't been born again, you're not a candidate for baptism. All you did was get wet. I've talked to people, I've been baptized this many times. Why do you have to keep getting baptized? The point is, what you really need is to be born again. And I'm not here to make you mad. If it does make you mad, I'm sorry. But the truth of the matter is, you must be born again. Amen. There is no other option. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if we can't trust what Jesus says, we're in a whole world of hurt. Who do we trust? I mean, God himself said, this is my son and who I am well pleased. Hear ye him. God gave his own act of, this is my son's stamp of approval, if you will. You better hear what my son has to say. And there are many today, they're thankful that Jesus died on the cross, but they're going to make it their own way. That's what they say. They're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. As we think about this, they mean well. I want you to look at what these people are doing in verses 21 and 22. They, or excuse me, verse 22 it says, They will say to that day, Lord, Lord, they're giving him the right title. It doesn't matter if you don't know him. They're calling him by the right name. It still won't change their destiny. And then they go on to say, Have we not prophesied in thy name? Boy. How many people are out there today prophesying in the name of Jesus, but they don't even know Jesus? They're telling you, oh, God wants you to be happy with yourself. Show me. It doesn't say that. God wants you to settle a debt. You can't pay it, but he has. He wants you to get things right with him. We have prophesied in thy name. Well, praise the Lord. Did you realize that Paul said that some pre people preach Jesus out of contention? They don't preach him for the right reason, but they're still preaching him. Praise the Lord, his name is going out. But the point of the matter is, there are many false prophets in the world today who name the name of Jesus because they know that will draw you in. Well, we know Jesus is a good man. Oh, he's more than a good man. Oh, he was a good prophet. He's more than a prophet. He was a priest. Oh, yes, after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But still, if you don't know him, it doesn't matter. If you have not received him as your only hope, it's not going to matter. Would you turn with me to Luke? Oh, they cast out demons as well. They cast out demons. Hey, that's a great thing. 
I think one of the biggest problems that we see in, in the modern church era today is that many people who say they're saved, they don't even believe that demons exist. Talk to your drug addicts. Talk to your alcoholics. Talk to those that are addicted to music, to pornography, whatever the case may be. Demons are real. And the problem is people don't want to admit that demons are real because they always want to say, well, it's not their fault that they're acting that way. Well, let me tell you about a man who can change all of that. Amen. Who was the only one that could cast out demons when the religious disciples could not cast out demons? The one that had to be cast out by Jesus Christ, and he told the disciples, listen, by prayer and fasting is this type cast out. But many people today, they don't even believe in hell. So why would they believe in demons and devils and things of that nature? See, what it boils down to many times... As we hold the Bible, how many of us believe the Bible? Amen. As we teach the Bible, how many of us really believe what we're teaching? Because if we don't, we're hypocrites. If we don't, we're liars. We are trying to tell people, believe this, believe this, but people are watching us. And as I was speaking to a brother right before church, you know, if I'm different at home than I am at church, something's wrong. If I don't have the same convictions at home as I do in church, am I saying I'm sinless? Oh, absolutely not. That's my wife. She'll tell you. Amen. Praise God for a patient woman. But the point of the matter is, yes, we're all sinners, but don't use that as, as an excuse to continue in your sin. Yes, none of us are perfect. Hallelujah. I know one who is. But that is still not a reason to continue in the way that we are. And listen... I don't know how you were raised. I know how I was raised, but that's no excuse for me to continue doing wrong. But doing right doesn't fix my problem. Please understand this. Turning over a new leaf, doing things that are good, those are wonderful, but if you don't know the Savior, they count for nothing. And it will not get you into heaven. In Luke chapter 16, how many of you are familiar with the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man died, and Lazarus died. And the rich man opened his eyes in hell, being in torments. And he wanted Father Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water, that he might have a drop of water to cool his tongue because he was being tormented in the flames. Do you know how many Christians don't believe that? Oh, that was a parable. It does not start out saying this is a parable. Jesus was giving us an account. And Jesus, when, when, uh, excuse me, when Abraham was talking to the rich man, and the rich man was wanting people to go to his, his family to warn them because he found out hell is real too late, Abraham did not tell him, well, you know, had you done these things in your lifetime, had you gone to church, you might have made it in. He didn't say, hey, had you been baptized, you wouldn't be in this place. He didn't say that. And he went on and arguing back and forth. Abraham said, look, we can't go to where you're at and you can't come to where we're at. There's a great gulf fix between us. He says, well, go to my brethren and tell them. Send someone from the dead. And he said, hey, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, referring to the scriptures, the Old Testament, if they will not believe the word of God about how to avoid going to hell, they will not believe the one return from the dead. Amen. Do we know someone who returned from the dead? Amen. God himself. The one who paid our price on the cross of Calvary. Amen. He returned from the dead. I was sharing with my teen class the other day. You know, it's one thing to have two or three witnesses. That will be enough to try to establish what is truth. But do you realize that Jesus was seen of over 500 people at the same time after he had been resurrected. If that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. And as we think about these things, we have the word of God to convince us. We have God's written holy word that he has given to us that men have shed their blood throughout history to preserve for us. God has preserved his word. And he used men, holy men of God, that were moved by the Spirit through the inspiration that came out of God. This is what I want you to write. And I use the example many times. When I was in the Navy, 
I was a yeoman. How many of you know what a yeoman is? Just a few. Let me give you a, a modern terminology. A secretary. All right? I worked directly for my commanding officer in my command. And do you know what I did as a secretary? He would say, I want to write a letter. He didn't write a letter. He says, I want to send a letter to some. He didn't send that letter. What did he do? He said, hey, Petty Officer Beck, come here. I want you to write this down. So I wrote it down. Then you know what else I had to do? I had to give that letter to him to let him read it to see if it's exactly what he told me to say. And then he says, all right, send it. Now I want you to ask, answer these questions to yourself. Was there any authority of mine on that letter? Did I have any power whatsoever in that letter? No. It was the one who told me to write it. It was his authority that was attached to that letter that I wrote and sent out. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. People are today are saying, I don't believe the Bible was written by a bunch of men. You tell me one book in this world that's not written by men. Yet you'll believe that people came from apes? You believe that we have no idea if we're a man or a woman? I don't want to believe things that's written by men. There's nothing that hasn't been written by men. The only difference here is God told them what to write, and they did exactly what he told them. The problem is, if you don't believe this, you're not going to believe what I say. And it doesn't matter if you believe what I say. You're not going to answer to me. We will all be judged by what is written in here. Every single one of us. And as we think about that rich man, he had all the riches. He could have done all the wonderful things in the world, but the biggest difference was he did not know Christ as his Savior. Then if you will, go to Acts chapter 8 with me, please. Acts chapter 8. I hope you're familiar with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of God doing what God does best. He arranges a divine appointment. Now, how many of you understand that when the Holy Spirit moved upon Philip to go and meet the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was right in the midst of a revival. Things were going great. People were getting saved. Lives were being changed. Philip! Yes, Lord. Go to the desert. It's hot, Lord. No, he didn't say that. Why, Lord? He didn't say that. Philip, go to the desert. Philip ran. Praise the Lord for people like Philip. As he was going to the desert, as he was obeying the Holy Spirit, here comes a chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch inside that chariot who had just returned from Jerusalem. He had gone to the temple in Jerusalem. And he was reading the word of God. What a great guy. What a wonderful man. He must be a Christian. He had traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship God. He's reading the word of God. The Holy Spirit must have been messed up. No, he said, Philip, go join thyself to this chariot. When he gets there, he sees the Ethiopian eunuch reading the word of God. He says, understandest what thou readest? How many of you own a Bible? Amen. Lots of lost people own a Bible. Did you know that most people treat this as a relic? As a religious relic that if you don't have this, you might go to hell? No, 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 no. You need what's in this. You need what this is talking about so that you don't go to hell. But as he's reading the book of Isaiah, and by the way, it wasn't the New Testament. It wasn't the New Testament. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I except some man should guide me? This man had been to Jerusalem. He didn't find what he needed in Jerusalem. He tried to worship God, but he still was empty. He's returning home, reading the Word of God, but he's confused. He's frustrated because he didn't understand. Philip gets up in the chariot, begins at the same place in Isaiah 53, and preaches unto him Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus was only around 2,000 years ago. That was, that, was, that was before. Isaiah was before the time that Jesus was alive. Oh, Jesus Christ is eternal. Amen. Jesus Christ has always been. In fact, he's the one that spoke the world into existence. John 1, 3, in case you're looking. John 1, 3. It tells you all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And as we think about this, from the Old Testament, from Isaiah 53, Jesus was preached. And 
while he was reading Isaiah, the, the eunuch wanted to know, well, who's this man speaking of, of himself or someone else? And then he preached Jesus. And as we think about it, as they going down the road, still in the chariot, they come to a place where there is water. And the eunuch says, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Boy, that, that's a big answer for a lot of people that are trying to be religious. That baptism. That baptism. But he said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Something was letting him know, first of all, I've never read in Isaiah 53 where you need to be baptized. I've not read it there yet. Maybe I'm missing something. But somehow he knew that baptism was important, but something was keeping him from being baptized. What hinders me? What's stopping me? What's prohibiting me? Then Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, he said this in verse 37, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You know, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tells us that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, a man believeth unto righteousness. As we, we think about that, so many people have a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they're trusting in that head knowledge to get them their entrance into heaven. It's not going to happen. I was one of those people. Listen to me. I was one of those people. I had a head knowledge of Jesus Christ, but I didn't have a heart knowledge. And as I was going to church for all the wrong reasons when I was saved, I went for the wrong reasons, but God pinholed me. He said, look, you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved. Now, I'd already told my wife I was saved because I thought I was. Now, am I going to argue with the Holy Spirit? I'm sorry, you're wrong. No. God opened my eyes. He allowed me to see that it's not what I know here. It's who I know here. Amen? The Holy Spirit showed to me that I needed Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Because while I believed the historical knowledge of the Savior, I was still trusting and doing that one thing better than I was doing bad. Keeping that good just one above the bad. So I could be weighed in the balance and it would just barely tick enough that I could go on in. How foolish, how prideful. But I was raised that way. That's not an excuse. It's not going to fly with the Lord. We have his word. So what's hindering me from being baptized? If you'll believe with all thine heart. The Ethiopian's answer was, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He became a candidate for believers' baptism. Why are you saying it that way? Because if you're not a believer and you get baptized, you just got wet. It didn't give you entrance into heaven. Let's continue on. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is our example? He is our example in everything, is he not? How many of you realize that in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, Jesus Christ was baptized? Hey, Jesus was baptized. I need to be baptized. Now let me ask you this. Did Jesus need to be saved? No. How can the Savior need to be saved? But what Jesus did was an act of obedience unto his Father, showing the world that he was submitting unto what his Father had called him to do. And through that baptism, it was an answer of a good conscience before God. As you'll read in Second Peter, it's an answer of a good conscience before God. He was basically telling everyone, I am submitted fully unto the Father. And by the way, he fulfilled the will of God. He's the only one that ever has, the only one that ever could. But as we think about this, he is our example in everything. He didn't need to be saved because he is the Savior. And for people to say, well, baptism saves me, then you're saying that Jesus was saved. I'm sorry, you can't save the Savior. He had no need of being saved. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And as we think about these, we've got to take the whole counsel and we've got to look at everything, not just pick out the things we like. Look at everything. Look at everything about him. He is our example on how to obey the Father. Have you obeyed the Father? I hope so. Then as we continue on, would you turn with me to Revelation chapter 20? Revelation chapter 20.
there are many people that are scared of this book. The only book in the Bible that promises a blessing if you read it. Amen. Hey, if you think that's a blessing, try reading the rest of it too. How many of you have been blessed by reading the Word of God? Hallelujah. I tell you what, I don't know what I would do without the Word of God. I don't know what I'd do. I'd die and be in hell. But thank God for His Word. Revelation chapter 20. If you have your place, please say amen. amen. Would you look with me at verse 12 and verse 13? Now, they're standing before the great white throne of judgment. John sees this in the vision that God allows him to see. And there's a judge there at that great white throne of judgment. Do you know who that is? It's my Savior. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. See, right now, he's still acting as the defense lawyer for all who will go to him and admit that they're guilty. He'll represent you before the Father. But at this point in time, in this great event that's going to take place, he's no longer the defense attorney. How many of you remember Brother Farrell preached on this, settle out of court? Wow, what a message. Amen. Glory to God. I encourage you to settle out of court. Amen. Amen. But he's the judge here. And as we see this, this is very important that you understand this. He's no longer going to say, well, you know what, I'll serve as your attorney real quick. No, he can't. He's the judge. He's got to cast judgment. But more importantly, look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, those without Christ, were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Look at the next part of this verse. According to their works. According to what they did. Are you listening? If you want to be judged according to what you're doing to see whether you're going to enter into heaven or not, you're going to be right before this great white throne of judgment. This is where you will stand if you are going to try to earn your way into heaven. Keep that in mind. Look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to what? Their works. All right, I'm doing the best I can. Fine, you'll stand before the great white throne of judgment. There will be judgment cast. The books will be opened, and you will be judged out of those books. And here's one of those books, by the way. You'll be judged out of those books according to your works. Now, let's look at the result. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, there's hell, which gives up the dead in it, in it, that stand before the great white throne of judgment, and they will be judged according to their works. It says it twice, does it not? Verse 12, verse 13. And we see that the end result of those who are judged according to their works, the very end of us all, the result, is every single one of them that were judged according to their works are cast into the lake of fire. There is no other option. See, if you're standing before the great white throne of judgment, it's too late. If you're standing before the judge, Jesus Christ, and you're hoping that when he opens those books, that somehow, some way, you did enough, that he's going to let you in, no, 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 you're going to be judged according to your works. And then you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And that is not God's will for you. Please turn back with me to Matthew chapter 7. I want to go back to those verses, those three verses that we started with. I want you to look at verse 21. <clears throat> because there might be some confusion about reading this verse if you don't know what God's will actually is. How many of you think God wants you to live right? I hope you all believe that. But that's not your entrance into heaven. How many of you believe that God wants you to do good things to other people? Please tell me you believe that. But that's not your way into heaven. 
How many of you believe that Jesus is Lord? Amen. That's not your way into heaven. How many of you think we ought to pray? Man, we ought to pray, but that's not your way into heaven. How many of you think we ought to be right where you're at this morning? In church. Hey, we ought to be here, but that's not going to get you there. Boy, I've been so happy to see these people follow in believers' baptism here recently. What a blessing that they are publicly declaring their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We're declaring to the world what we believe when we obey in believer's baptism. And I'm very careful to say it the way I say it. Because you can't get baptized. It's not going to count for anything unless you've been saved. Another question, just a sideline here. What about that thief on the cross? Did Jesus cry out to the soldier, Wait! we got to have a baptism. But, Brother John, God made an exception. Does God make exceptions? The same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. He didn't come off the cross. There was no coming off the cross until you were dead. He got saved, though. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When did that happen? After that thief recognized that he was there justly, that he was being crucified because he deserved it, but he realized that Jesus was crucified and he didn't deserve it. How many of you realize that Jesus, yes, he was crucified, but he didn't deserve it? I do. I deserve to die that death on the cross, but thank God he paid it for me. You may like me, you may think I'm a great person, but I'm nothing without Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now this may confuse you. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. A lot of times we look at the will of the Father and we automatically think, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What does God want me to do? And by the way, God wants you to do things. But if you don't get to first base, you can't go to second base, third base, and even home. Amen? Salvation is the beginning. You must be born again. But as we think of these things, if you'll turn with me to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at verse 23. If you have your place, please say amen. If you need more time, say, what was me? Y'all are not being honest. <laughs> Amen. Listen, it's important that you see what God has to say. Amen. Verse 23, the Bible says, and this is his commandment, that we should go to church, that we should be baptized. Give that tithe. Say your prayers. Be nice to one another. No, 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 no. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Did you realize that being saved is a commandment from God? In fact, Jesus put it this way to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said, you must be born again. I think we can trust Jesus. Amen. If you haven't come to the point where you can trust Jesus, you need to trust Jesus. And that's not going to happen unless the Holy Spirit's working in your heart. That's not going to happen unless you believe what God's Word says. Now, if you're like me, I don't know every single thing God's Word says as far as understanding it. I've read the Bible several, many times through. But I don't understand everything. And I, if anyone tells you they understand everything, even our own pastor tells you he doesn't understand everything. But if you meet a person that does, I'd run from them. But the thing is, we ought to tr strive to know more and more about the Bible. But here's a clear commandment. God wants you to believe on his son. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the Bible. Jesus Christ is also the word. 
think about that. Then if you'll turn back a few pages towards the, the front, the second Peter chapter three, I also want you to see another will of God concerning those who don't know Jesus. Second Peter chapter three. Look at verse nine. I hope that you're already familiar with this. Are you there with me? The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. God's not lazy. He's not lapsadaisical. He keeps his word. Amen. Amen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you see a person that says, there's no hope for me, show them this verse. Say, God, can't, God won't save me. I've, I've done too, too much. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And by the way, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And another thing, if God didn't care about you, he wouldn't allow his son to die for you. He knew, he knows you can't pay that sin debt. You can't, but it has been paid. I was sharing the gospel with someone the other day, and, and sadly there was no conviction while I was sharing it with this person, even though they gave a false interest in what I was saying. See, when you read the word of God to someone and they're truly interested, the Holy Spirit's going to do something. Listen to me, the Holy Spirit's going to do something. His word will not return void. And if that person is truly listening and, and, and seeking God, God's going to open their eyes to the truth. And I gave this example. And I said, you know, when we, how many of you bought gifts for other people for their birthday or Christmas or whatever the case may be? When you gave that gift to that person, did you say, all right, you know, the price of that was such and such and I need that money? No, it's not a gift then, is it? See, a gift, it costs somebody something, but it's free to you. And the gift of salvation is free. Amen. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Or is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as you think of that, the, the, the gift of salvation was purchased. And it's being given out. It's free to whosoever. And I asked this person that I was talking to, I said, you know, it's been purchased, it's being offered to you, but when is it yours? And the person said, well, it's already been bought, so it must be mine. I said, but do you have it? Do you have it, though? Yes, it's been purchased. Yes, it's for you. But is it yours yet? It can be yours. It's free to you. But it costs someone something. And I said, is it yours? And the person said, no. And I said, well, when will it be yours? And they said, when I receive it. And I've seen the light come on many a times when I talk to someone like that. The light didn't come on that day. And I was sad because I really want to see this person get saved. But, you know, yes, it's been purchased. Yes, it's being offered. But until you receive it, it's not yours. And therefore, you're still going to be in that category of those that will be judged according to their works. And believe me, you don't want to be there because you can't pay that price you will not be able to sufficiently cover that price because it, the price has already been paid. And to sit and think that you can pay that price is blasphemy against Jesus Christ because there was no other way for the price to be paid. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, how many of you remember being born? Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> and as we think of this, Jesus said you must be born again. And, of course, Nicodemus was confused. You're going to enter again into your mother's womb? Praise God. Women say no. But the thing is, does the baby do any work during the birthing process? Nope. The mother does. The mother does all the work. And God. Amen. And so when you get born again, it's nothing that you can do. It's nothing that you can do. All you can do is let God take over and save you and birth you again Amen. by the Spirit. And a lot of times, listen, we tell people, you pray this prayer. That prayer is not going to save you. I don't care if you did say that prayer. 
It's not the prayer that's going to save you. It's Jesus that's going to save you. And how many times has pastor made it so clear from the pulpit? Just receive him. Call out to him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Not from here. From here. Amen. Right. Putting your complete confidence. How many of you checked out the pews that you're sitting in to make sure they were sturdy before you sat down this morning? Did anybody take time to make sure all the screws were in place and, 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 and make sure that the, the pew wasn't rocking? How many of you did that this morning? I didn't see anybody do that. You sat down with full confidence in that pew when you sat down this morning. Right? Can we not trust Jesus more? If you don't know him, you may still have doubts. But let me tell you, those of us that know him, you can trust him without even looking at the pew. And you can sit down knowing that he is going to keep his word. This morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Again, it's no accident that you're here this morning. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. As many people that we communicate with through the internet ministry and things of that nature. You know, they, they believe what they hear, they like what they hear, but they still are worried that they're not doing enough that they can enter into heaven. They're not. They're not, but it's a clear sign that they need to be born again. If you're hoping that you're going to do all the right things, you're not. If you're hoping that if you change enough, you're going to be able to get in, you're not going to be able to change enough. Jesus is not saying, clean up your life and then come to me when you have everything right. It's not going to happen without Jesus. Jesus is saying, come as you are. I don't care what you bring with you. I've already paid for it. I don't care what you've done. As Brother Van already mentioned, the chief of sinners has already been saved. The worst sinner, according to what is recorded in the Word of God... God allowed it to be recorded for all eternity. The chief of sinners has already been saved. Therefore, the rest of sinners can be saved. You say, you don't know what I've done. No, he does. And he still willingly paid for your sin that you are so afraid of, and you should be. But listen, Jesus has already taken care of it. Would you come to him this morning? Would you come and call upon him this morning? You don't even have to come. Just call on him this morning. Right where you're at. Lord Jesus, save me. Because God is not willing that any should perish. God does not want one single person to go to hell. I don't care who you are. He died for you. He paid the debt for you because he loves you. You say, I'm not lovable. I know that, but he loves you still. I'm not lovable, but he loves me still. There's nothing to love in me other than Jesus, praise his holy name. Would you come to the Lord this morning? Would you quit playing and trusting in what you can do because you're going to end up in hell. You're going to die and you're going to lift up your eyes being in torments in this horrible flame and then ultimately you will be cast into the lake of fire. I don't like having to say it, but I need to say it because it is God's word. You must be born again. This morning, if there's any doubt in your mind whatsoever about your salvation, you need to come to Christ. You need to call out to him immediately. He will remove all doubt. When you receive him as your Savior, he will remove all doubt. He'll give you that peace that passeth all understanding. I encourage you this morning, if you're not saved, today is the day of salvation. Father in heaven, Lord, I've done all I can. Lord, it's nothing that I can do. It's only you now that has to work. Father, this is what you allowed your son to die for. And Lord, I pray for those out there today that are fighting, that are struggling, hoping, praying, wondering, struggling if they've done everything right. Lord, help them to realize they cannot do anything right. All they can do is call upon your son. Dear Holy Spirit, please, that person whose heart you're working in right now, help them to call out to Christ. Help them to receive him as their personal Savior today. Lord, you're the only one that can move in this way. You're the only one that can do anything. Please, Father, I beg you because of your word, because of what your promises say, work in those people's hearts. 
Father, those of us that are saved, Father, help us not to come to the point where we think people should try to do better, to try to act better before we'll witness to them. Lord, they need to be saved now. Father, they need to realize their need of you now. Lord, we cannot try to keep people from hearing the truth because they don't live the way that we want them to. Father, they need to hear the truth so that you can begin to work in their life. Lord, those of us that are believers, help us to never lose sight of where you found us. Lord, help us to never lose sight of what we deserve still today. But thanks unto you for your unspeakable gift. Oh, Father, please do a work which only you can do this morning. Lord, if there's someone that needs to be saved, help them. God, God, give them the faith that they need to be saved this morning. I ask in Christ's name for his honor and glory. Amen. Brother, if you'll start us in a second.